and welcome to the About to Interview podcast. I'm your host, that guy named John. This is a supplemental version of the About to Interview podcast, which drops every Wednesday and covers movies, TV shows, film festivals, and more. You can follow the podcast on all forms of social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at About to Review. And make sure to subscribe on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Blueberry, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This show focuses solely on the conversations that I have with authors, directors, actors, and creators, and is available on YouTube as well as subscribing to the podcast. Make sure to click the subscribe button below, give a thumbs up, and check out the full show notes with links to the guests at abouttoreview.com. Joining the show right now is a very special guest, which I am honored to have on the show, uh, Peter Serafinowicz. How are you? Ah, I'm great, man. And by the way, can I just say thank you for pronouncing my name correctly? Well, I say correctly, pronouncing it in the same way that I do, Serafinowicz. <laughs> I, I, I don't really, I don't really care that much about it, but uh, when when people do pronounce it correctly. Uh, or they, you know, or, or or they don't say, "Oh, that's a long name." Uh, <laughs> right. it, it always gives me a little, uh, a little boost. So you've got twenty five points already for doing that. So yes, well done. All right, I'm I'm putting that down on my scorecard right now. Every time I record, I keep a scorecard. I hope you know. So twenty five points in the bank. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, don't, don't don't brag about it because there'll, there'll be points deducted for bragging. Oof. Okay. Good to know. Uh, so for those people who, who are unaware who I am speaking to, of course, Peter is the star of the new Amazon series, The Tick, which is debuting here in just a few days, uh, which everyone is really excited about. So I just have a few questions for you. The first one being, okay. you, you have been a part of some major movie franchises like Star Wars and Guardians of the Galaxy and John Wick 2. How satisfied and how does it feel to now be the star of your own superhero franchise? Uh, well, um, I, uh, it feels it feels amazing. I mean, you know, um, who, who wouldn't want to play a superhero? Uh, it, 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 you know, in any in any kind of capacity, and then for, for, for something as kind of surreal and funny and beautifully written and realized as the tick. I mean, it's, it's in many ways the, the, the kind of perfect role for me, you know, and I'm so, uh, I, I'm so pleased that I, that, that I'm, I'm honored that Ben Edlund, the creator of the mm -hmm. tick, who's also the writer and showrunner of this, this particular iteration is, is, uh, has entrusted the character to, to, to me, you know, um, um, because this is his, it's kind of like his life's work. I mean, mm -hmm. he's done a lot of other work besides, but like, this is, this is, uh, you know, it's like his baby. Although he does have an actual baby. Well, she's, <laughs> right. she's not a baby anymore. She's, <laughs> she's, uh, I think she's 15 now, but she's, um, but yeah, this is, I guess, his other baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a huge responsibility, and 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 as I said, it's a it's a great honor, and I and you know, to, to, and and to, to, to say it's like to be the how do I feel about being the star of it? I I, I feel I mean it, that's nice, right? First of mm -hmm. all, but also and nice of you to say that. But I, I feel like although the show is called the Pick, and I play the character that Pick, I, I I don't really feel. Like I'm the star of the show. Like first of all, I feel it's like an ensemble piece. Okay. Definitely. I, I don't know. I don't know how many episodes you've seen, but it really is. It, it, it's a really amazing group of actors that that, that are in this, this show and characters. That, I mean, it's, it's definitely an ensemble show. But also, I think if, if I was talking about the star of the show, it would be Griffin, Griffin Newman, who oh, plays yeah. Arthur. Uh huh. Uh, it, I would say he's he is he's the star of the show. He's uh, he he plays the character that the author, 
who at first believes that the fish is just it only exists in his mind and is a mm-hmm. product of, of his uh, his psychological problems. Um, and uh, his his performance is just so unbelievably funny and nuanced and heartbreaking and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So look, I I, I feel like I'm I'm just thrilled to be part of this whole, this ensemble. Excellent. And you you just mentioned, of course, the <sighs> the creator of the tick, Ben Edlund, and he has been involved in. Yeah in every iteration of The Tick, and this being the third one. What were kind of some key pieces of advice he gave you of how to get into the mind of The Tick? Um, I suppose he told me that uh, Tick embodies the, the very basic spirit of what it is to be a superhero in that he fights bad guys and he saves people. Mm-hmm. And he's extremely good at that. And that, anything outside of that particular sphere, he, he becomes very confused. And uh, in a way, he's like, um, he's, like a, he's like a child. He's like a huge child, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, it's, one, uh, one of the, it's one of the things that really appealed to me about when I, when I read the script. I thought, wow, is this guy who's like, He's this huge, blue, nigh invulnerable superhero, and all he wants is for Arthur to be his friend. Mm-hmm. That's all he wants. <laughs> right. And it's like, it just reminded me of that aching longing he had as a kid, like wanting, the, wanting some other kid in your class to be your friend so desperately, and then not, not, um, not responding to you, you know, resisting. It's like it was like it's like unbearable. Or like a girl that you like, or uh, I don't know, but like I, I love that about him. And you know, and Ben said, you know, the the, the thing about his uh, his vulnerability is, is, a, is a kind of key is a key part of this particular iteration of, mm-hmm. of the pick. You know, um, I think also. Like, because I'm quite a sort of voicey kind of guy, we got into the my version of the character by uh, I before I met Ben, we met over Skype, mm-hmm. and I read some of Tick's dialogue to Ben over Skype uh, in what I thought was was the was the voice, you know, and it was right. kind of a weird moment. I agreed to do the show, and and I said, well, look, let me let me. Let me have a go and see what you think of my, you know, my initial take on it. And, you know, it, it, it turned out we were on pretty much the same page, you know. Ben nice. said to me, like, vocally, he's kind of a bit like a kind of 1960s, 70s American radio announcer. Mm-hmm. And that's, to me, that, that type of voice has always resonated with me. Um, I loved it as a kid, and I loved the I loved the whole idea of Americanness as a kid, you know, and that sort of seemed to crystallize it for me, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. so, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess um, I mean that was that was it. I mean, really, as well, Ben sort of, as I said before, he trusted me, you know, he trusted mm-hmm. my instincts, and uh, I think they were, you know, fortunately they were largely correct you know and, and there would be times that early on when we started shooting when I would suggest an ad lib and Ben would say you know that's that's good but it, it's not Tick wouldn't be as self aware as that or Tick gotcha. wouldn't uh, wouldn't be wouldn't even have any kind of sense of being cruel about somebody you know mm-hmm. if, if maybe the, the line had uh, elements of that about it, you know, and, and I think then pretty quickly it became, uh, yeah, I knew what would work and what wouldn't, you know, if, if I ever sort of ventured to, to sort of add anything. And you mentioned, of course, your voice, which is one of the many things you are are known for. You have done, I mean, so many TV projects and voiceover work. 
So do you have any kind of pre-game or pre-show rituals you have to get your voice ready, which is just, if I say, if I were to say so myself, just this golden voice. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would say it's a platinum voice. Oh, okay. Right but anyway, I mean, you know, we'll, we can have different different of these. But I, I, no, there's no kind of vocal routine that I do or warm up exercise or nothing like that. Really, uh, I guess it, it's just something that I I had a knack for when I was a kid, and I. I enjoy I enjoy doing you know I enjoy mm-hmm. I enjoy playing around with my voice and impersonating people and you know I enjoy listening I think that's that's the thing that you know with with accents and voices and stuff a, a huge part of it perhaps the most important part is listening to people's voices mm-hmm. and uh, and so I I enjoy I enjoy that you know usually if I if, if, for instance, I impersonate somebody, it's because there's something about their voice that I, or their personality that I, that I really dig in some way, that I connect with, you know, and, uh, um, yeah, so I, I, I uh, it, it, it's how I get into stuff, you know, it's how it's like some people, some actors will, you know, they like wear the shoes of the character or right. watch how the character moves, you know, um, I think for me, it's more of a kind of definitely more of a vocal based thing. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, I was hoping for some some key tips because I'm always looking to improve. So I thought, why not ask the the expert? You've got a you've got a perfectly nice voice, as far as I can tell on this phone line. You know, it's, it sounds it's 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 lovely. It's got a nice quality. You've got a nice range and. Uh, what is it you want to particularly improve? <laughs> well, that was mainly just kind of, you know, if there were any of those pregame things or, you know, how you get ready. Uh, but, I mean, I definitely, I think that listening part is is crucial. And I think that that helps people, you know, in anything that they are doing, you know, preparing for a role, preparing for something is just kind of listening. So so I appreciate that. And I will definitely uh, use yeah. that. Um one of the other yeah. things that I wanted sure. to definitely ask you about, uh, pertaining back to the show, is between the original pilot that came out last year and the debut of the series, there was a dramatic costume change from the kind of more organic look of the pilot to this bombastic blue that we have in the new version. Which one of those kind of made you mm. feel more like a superhero? <laughs> I think they both uh, they were they were they were both kind of cripplingly uncomfortable <laughs> and uh, and and very hard to move around in and they had their own unique battery of problems mm-hmm. um, as I think if you know as I think if anybody anybody who's any actor who's played a superhero or wears some kind of costume will tell you, you know, that they uh, that they end up hating those costumes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, really. Both of them, for the first half an hour of wearing them, both of them made me feel like, uh, like uh, it was so fun, like stomping around the parking lot outside the studio and, and mm-hmm. in both of those costumes, you know, for the first half an hour. And then everything after that was not so fun. <laughs> Totally understandable. I mean, the suit itself is is incredible. And I mean, the way that you look in the suit, it just really fits with the character and the tone. And I loved the sound design for when you were just walking around, you know, that added bass that they added. Yeah, where it just I love like, that. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> it just, it, yeah, it made the character really feel real and and grounded in this world, this hyper reality that you have. Yeah, I mean the, the the world itself is is a real world that in which superheroes happen to exist, but it is definitely a real world. I say it's slightly heightened, but it's it's not like a zany kind of you know everybody is is playing it very straight, you know. Mm-hmm. But then and then I my character Hick is like suddenly this this big blue lunatic shows up. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> and he, he's like he's like out of a cartoon and in this world. And even the superheroes in the world are like, who is this guy? You know. Right. Um, I, I I I like that that I'm in, or rather, Tick is in his own sort of show, whatever he's doing. You know. Oh, um, for sure. But, but still, and still, but, but but also as the series goes on, you know, he starts to. You know, he starts to become a little bit sort of self-aware and, like, he starts to question why he does things and mm-hmm. where he came from. And, and that gets kind of quite interesting, you know? I mean, he's so, he's so positive and lovable and, and uh, he has a very short attention span. And so these things don't kind of trouble him for a long time. Mm-hmm. They start to kind of pile up, and like he starts to kind of question everything, you know. And it's 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 great how his character develops. But he manages to develop yet stay exactly the same, which which which, which I love, and it's a testament to Ben Ben's writing and and David Fury as well, who's the other main writer of the mm-hmm. show. Um, that 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 this that this happens. That, you know, who could be kind of this kind of two-dimensional character. He certainly, you know, although although he seems like he's in his own show, he's like he's definitely real. You mm-hmm. know, he's over the top, and he's 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 larger by a great deal than life. You know, and, absolutely. And, but but yeah, but, but he manages to remain real. I, I, I hope, anyway, I hope that's what, that's what people think when they watch the show. Yeah, and I think, I mean, one of my favorite characteristics that you portrayed in the show is just that blissful naivete that, that the Tick has and his, his kind of view on the world. At one point in the second episode, uh, when Miss Lint, you know, is attacking the Tick with lightning and her eye pops out and you said, you know, look out, she attacks with flying glass eyeballs. Things like that were just, just yeah. that blissful naivety was just gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, it's actually that was, I think that was my favorite line of the whole of the whole show. I mean, there was there was so many, but like I was just doing some ADR recordings, some of the later episodes, mm-hmm. and I the thing about Ben's writing is it's so it's so poetic, mm-hmm. so. Um, it's such a, it's so, it's so beautifully written that, you know, sometimes I'd want to be take after the pace of a, of a particular thing because it was such, just because it was such a pleasure to read, to perform. Um, and I, I really, you know, I, I sometimes look at, look, look at the scripts and would we'll be shaking my head in awe, at like, what, uh, 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 the beauty of one of Edwin's sentences. Awesome. Uh, and the intricacy of, you know, the hidden, the, the, the hidden doors and the, uh, the, the, the kind of, the U-turns and the sort of, the, sometimes the whole sentence, it, it, it's almost like the, the entire sentence is a palindrome, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it, he's, he's incredible. He's incredible. And it's, and, 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 yeah, so as I said earlier, you know, it's such a privilege to, that this is, you know, it's my job to read this, to read these beautiful mm-hmm. words. So, Peter, thank you so much. I know that you have a crazy busy schedule. You are currently in New York, uh, as people can, can hear the amazing New York City behind you. Uh, so I just, I really yeah. appreciate you <laughs> taking I'm, I'm the time. I'm in a quiet spot as well. Right. But yeah, it was lovely speaking to you, man. You too. Thank you so much. And the show comes out in just a few days. So Peter Serafinowicz, uh, you are incredible. And I look forward to seeing more of your amazing work. Thank you so much. And an extra 25 points for another wonderful pronunciation. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. Talk to you soon. All right. See you. Bye-bye. Joining me from the LA Press Day, of The Tick is Griffin Newman, who plays Arthur on The Tick. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. 
Yeah, I'm glad that we were able to uh, work this out because, yeah, you are in L.A. doing press all day for, for this amazing yes. new show. Yes, I am. I, it feels like I've been doing press for the last six weeks straight, which I pretty much have. Some breaks, but it's a lot of, a lot of talking about the show. I was going to say. Thank God I like the show. This is like my favorite TV show that I just happen to be a part of. Awesome. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I just have a, a few quick questions for you. Uh, this series, compared to the other versions uh, that we know of with the cartoon and the previous live action, this one focuses a lot more on Arthur as a central character. Was there a lot of pressure on you? And if so, how did you deal with that? Yeah, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot <laughs> of pressure. I mean, I would have felt very overwhelmed by being given the chance to play Arthur in any version of the tick. It's a lot of responsibility. It's a character I love. It's a property I've loved for a really long time. I would have felt that pressure no matter what. But then this added the pressure of a lot of the show is resting on your shoulders. You're kind of the guy pushing along the narrative, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it came out organically in, you know, Ben Edlund, who created the comic and has been behind every incarnation yeah. of these characters wanted to try to make a show, a new version of The Tick that had sort of a greater emotional investment, you know? Mm -hmm. A little deeper than just being a parody and a satire of superhero culture. Uh, still have all those elements in that sort of classic Tick absurdity, but add some depth into the characters that really make you root for them. And The Tick is such an unchanging, unwavering sense of good, you know? Right. He just knows exactly what he stands for that it's hard to really put him through an emotional narrative. Mm -hmm. He might be challenged by an enemy physically, but he kind of always knows what he stands for and what he's trying to do. So the focus kind of shifted onto Arthur a little more because Arthur, you can have go through a kind of traditional hero's journey, uh, even more so than most characters, because he's a guy who has a thousand reasons to doubt himself. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a lot of pressure. The way I um, kind of uh, worked with that pressure and didn't let it overwhelm me is that I just tried to use it because Arthur as a character is someone who's constantly in over his head, uh, has a lot of responsibility and isn't sure if he's up to the challenge. And that's how like I felt as an actor. If I was asked to be the lead of a show like this, but also was supposed to be confident and calm, <laughs> right. I could have done it. But Arthur, you know, there was one day where I was playing some scene where I was freaking out and, and Ben Edlin came up to me afterwards and he said, you did a really good job of that. And I said, you want to know my secret? And he said, yeah. And I said, whenever I need to be freaked out in a scene, I just think about the fact that if I don't do my job well, this entire show will suck. <laughs> and that's, that's what I get, get the nerves up when I need to have full Arthur freak out. I mean, that definitely, I can see that as, as being motivation because like you said, Ben Edlund, the amazing creator of The Tick, the comic, and all of the iterations, when he is there and you know that this <laughs> is his baby, that motivation is staring you in the face. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I said, I've said it's sort of like um, uh, watching your dad on the sidelines while you play like little league soccer and trying to make him proud. Mm -hmm. Except I was never good at soccer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it's like your dad is sort of behind the monitor, you know, the guy who fathered these characters, mm -hmm. you know. And Arthur, as a character, is even older than I am as a person. You know, wow. he's lived for so long. I'm the first person to be in a version of the Tick who was born after the Tick was created. You know, that only is pretty by crazy. Two, but it's pretty crazy to think about. You know, I've never lived in a world where Arthur didn't exist as a character. Mm -hmm. So it's nerve wracking that you really want to, you know, make him happy. But it also means that if you make him happy, it kind of alleviates a lot of stress because you go like, if Ben's happy with what I'm doing, then that's okay. Yeah. You know. <laughs> He's the guy. It's not someone reinterpreting the character and you don't know if their interpretation is correct. He has such a fine sense of who these characters are. And when you make him happy, it's like the greatest feeling in the world. He's got an incredible laugh. He's got this little like, hoo hoo hoo, kind of giggle <laughs> he does. And when you hear him do that in response to something you're doing, it's just like, okay, I'm okay. I can calm down a little bit. Now, not too much because you still have to act stressed out. But <laughs> right. you know. In those moments when you would hear his reactions on set did that kind mm -hmm. of did it take you that moment to be like hey he likes me oh wait crap i am in the scene he was good he, ne he never would laugh when the cameras are rolling but you know when you get in in the morning and you're sort of rehearsing the scene so you can mm -hmm. do camera blocking and figure it out he would laugh during that and so in rehearsal we're rehearsing it a bunch of times before we start filming trying to figure the scene out the second you heard one of those laughs you'd go like okay i think i found it 
Now I just have to keep doing that once the cameras are rolling. But he was he was very good at not laughing and, and ruining the take. Oh, yeah. you're good, good. You are a comedian and you are also a, a fellow podcaster uh, huh? for Blank Check Podcast. Big shout out to, to you guys. You have done a ton of episodes, only the first part of which was all Star Wars based. Uh, <laughs> right, our first episode was all Star Wars. We thought we were just going to be a Star Wars podcast. And at the end of the year, we felt good about the sort of dynamic we had built. And then we figured out, like, well, how do we make this sustainable? And we sort of morphed into the show we are now. Nice. So Sorry, with, I cut off your question midstream. Oh, no, no, it's totally fine. Basically, with, with all the things you do with, with comedy, stand-up comedy, and with the podcast, your version of Arthur is this fanatical researcher due to an event yeah. that happened to him in his childhood. When you were researching this, even though you have always loved the character, what were some of those things that you really wanted to bring into your version of Arthur? Yeah, I, you know, I... I went fanatical, as you kind of imply right there. I'm a fairly obsessive person. I'm kind of like a pop culture omnivore. And, you know, there was a lot of the tech that I was familiar with and was a fan of. And there were a lot of blind spots I had. And I just tried to become a completist with all of it. Hmm. I want to have all of it stored in my mind. But um, Ben was always adamant that he didn't want me to feel too much pressure to replicate what other people had done, you know? Okay. He would say those other things, they're alternate reality versions of what you're playing. You have to make it your own guy. But oh. I, you know, I wasn't studying all of it so that I could replicate poses from the comics or replicate the voice that Rob Paulson or Mickey Dolenz did. It was more about trying to find those fundamental elements of who the character is. And I think the thing I really kind of, through reading and watching everything hit on that sort of really started standing out to me was how um, kind and kind of gentle he is as a character. I, you know, his defining trait is his anxiety, is his neuroses. <laughs> right. You know, that's sort of this motivating thing. But there's a re reason he goes out into battle, despite the fact that he is overwhelmed by these circumstances and is not physically fit to be fighting these enemies. And it's because he does have this really strong sense of justice and this uh, compassion for other people, you know, and he wants to live in a better world where people do nice things for each other. And watching, you know, the the other shows and the, the comics, that was the thing that really kind of jumped out to me that felt like the most important thing to play to keep this character alive is, you know, he's as terrified as any of us. He's not choosing to go out and fight these battles because he's got power and mm -hmm. he can do it to do it because he knows it's the right thing to do and even though this version adds all this backstory with the terror and his father and all these things that are greater motivating factors i just felt like it was that sort of human sense of, of just pure decency and finding a way to marry that decency to that fear and anxiety that was kind of the biggest thing to me excellent uh and then lastly so ben edland as we have talked about before in the comic and all the other versions does a really great job of doing these satirical versions of popular villains and popular heroes. In your opinion, if you could relate Arthur to a, to a, quote unquote, a real world analog of these popular characters, who would that be? Sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, when we were doing the pilot, uh, Valerie Curry, who plays my sister Dot, mm -hmm. said to me, like, I'm kind of playing Spider-Man in this, right? And it feels like in some way this new version of Arthur and sort of circumstance, you know, and sort of attitude is, you know, uh, a, a far less mentally, uh, you know, balanced Spider-Man, you know, mm -hmm. he's got the same sort of drive. It's sort of the great power with great responsibility, except he doesn't really have power. He just <laughs> is trying his hardest, you know, and I think, yeah, I think, you know, it, it certainly I don't feel like when this character was originally created, it was meant to be a satire of Spider-Man. But I think in this version, it's sort of turned into a sort of off-kilter version of, of that character. Excellent. Okay. Sort of a lower status Peter Parker. Lower status Peter Parker. All right. Hey, that is still a great version and a great analog. So it well, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, one of the things that I, I hope to see maybe down the road is... Uh, Chairface Chippendale, or maybe Man Eating Cow. You and me both. He, he's the one that everyone asks about. It's always, without fail, the number one most fan requested character. 
I think Ben really wanted to try to, you know, focus this season in on Tick, Dot, Arthur, and the Terror as mm-hmm. our kind of legacy characters and spend some time building up some new characters to differentiate this thing as its own world. But he, I think the bigger plan has always been if we can set up this show well, we can do these 12 episodes across these two half, you know, seasons and get people on board, then the stage is sort of set to bring in some of these characters. And he certainly knows the chair face is the one that everyone's asking for. So my fingers are crossed just as tightly as yours. I'm a fan and I want to be able to do scenes with chair face Chippendale. It would be <laughs> really cool. Excellent. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Griffin, for taking the time to do this. The show uh, is coming out actually today by the time this airs. So I encourage everybody to go check it out and see your version of a Peter Parker slash Arthur <laughs> in sure. the tick. Uh, thank you so much. Pleasure for talking to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you for listening to the About to Interview podcast, which is an About to Interview production. Make sure to click the subscribe button below, give a thumbs up, and check out the full show notes with links to the guests below, as well as on the website abouttoreview.com. Thank you to my amazing guests, and also thank you to Vexing Media, who provides audio and video editing services for this podcast. They're a graphic design, website design, and digital media company. You can find all of their work at vexingmedia.com, as well as on Facebook and Twitter at Vexing Media. Make sure to follow the podcast on all forms of social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at About to Review, and subscribe to the podcast About to Review, which comes out every Wednesday.